as we start this morning, um, we're going to be looking, as I mentioned, at First Thessalonians, and we're going to be looking at what was one of Paul's first epistles, and in doing so, um, looking at a few things. And I'm excited for the opportunity. Um, it's a it's a letter filled with both encouragement and challenge. And as we look to that. Uh, those words that Paul has for us, he's writing a young church and searching out how they're doing in the midst of their difficulties and the tribulations and the turmoil that they're in. And uh, there, there's no better nor fitting book for us during this time of life and the season that we're in. Um, the challenge to be able to uh, walk in a, in a manner worthy of the Lord and keep our hope fixed on the Lord himself in the midst of, of all that's happening around us. Um, I'm going to start this morning by actually opening Acts in chapter 17, because that's where we read Paul first interacting with the Thessalonians in Thessalonica. And so, as always, I'm going to be sharing a few things this morning, and that's going to be a springboard to allow you to share what you have the Lord uh, sharing on your heart. And so um, I'm going to open the word and we're going to dive right in and I'll read uh, Acts 17 and then we're going to segue into our time where we'll be reading uh, perhaps some of the first chapter of First Thessalonians this morning. Listen to what it says as Paul journeyed into uh, Thessalonica. Acts 17 and verse 1. Now, when they had traveled through Am Amphipolis and Ampollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures and explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer to rise again from the dead and saying that this Jesus, whom I'm proclaiming to you, is the Christ. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous, taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar, attacking the house of Jason. They were seeking to bring them out to the people. And when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men who've upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another King Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. Now, I want you to hear what comes next in verse 10 of Acts 17. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. And now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. Now, as we read Acts 17, it's a great, a great depiction of, of Paul's journeys. And as he would go in, it wasn't always with a great reception, but more great opposition to what he had to say. I love how it says in verse 10, that immediately as Paul and Silas were went away by night, they went into Berea, and it describes the Bereans as more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. They were, they, they were willing to look, to listen, to examine the scriptures, and see whether the things that he were today, that everything we take in, we need to take and hold to the light of the gospel and examine the scriptures. But as Paul was speaking, relaying, and, uh, and, and sharing with these people, God was moving the hearts, even in the midst of this great difficulty, great opposition, and great rejection. People were coming to the Lord. You have to imagine, as Paul was in Thessalonica, he quickly 
led a number of people to, to Jesus and to know the Christ, and yet then was as quickly sent out by night uh, to be saved from those who were pursuing him. It, it gives you the context now that as Paul was in Corinth, he's writing back. He's actually sent Timothy to find out how they're doing in Thessalonica. Here's a young church that had started in the midst of great opposition, great turmoil, and great difficulty, and his heart was with them. He longed to be with them, and he longed to know what they were doing and how they were doing in their newfound faith before the Lord. And so you get this understanding of the yearning that he had. And I love how each epistle that Paul writes, there's a context to them. It's like when we look at 1 Corinthians, we quickly realize that that wasn't the first letter Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. It's the first letter that we have in our hands, but he actually writes in 1 Corinthians, now I wrote you about and so he had already written them about many things. He then goes on in 1 Corinthians and says, now concerning the things I wrote you about. And it tells us that there was correspondence and Paul had already written them. In fact, when we get to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians may well be the third, the fourth, or the fifth letter exchanged between these two parties that by 2 Corinthians had had a, a relationship that had become disgruntled. And they were seeking the Lord's healing in the midst of it. And, and now we get this, this passion, this understanding that Paul, who had discipled and led this young church to the Lord, both Jews and Greeks, was now sending Timothy back to find out how they were doing and wanted to encourage them in the midst of the difficulties that he himself felt when he was there. Now, I share that to lead us into Paul's actual writing, and I want you to note that as we dive into this letter together, and remember, it is that, a passionate letter from someone who knew Jesus and wanted to be sure that those whom he had led in the Lord were following in his footsteps in a walk faithful to Jesus, the Lord. We're going to be looking at a number of things this morning. Paul is going to start by both giving thanksgiving for this church and remembering his time with the church and who the church is. And it's going to move on into a time of instruction and encouragement and comfort in the midst of the difficulties. Again, as I mentioned to you guys, something that's so fitting for our time and season of life, that, that today the second coming of Christ is our hope for comfort, but also an incredible empowering motivation to live a godly life as we walk on this earth today. And so with that, I'm going to turn to 1 Thessalonians. And chapter one, and I'm going to read the first chapter. Remember, as I said, this is a letter. The chapters and verses were never there. Those were added later for reference sake, so that we might be able to refer to a sentence, a line, or, or a section. But this is a man passionately writing in the Lord, longing that these people might know, know him know his heart, and ultimately, and more importantly, know the Lord's heart. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1 says this, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God's grace, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. 
you know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of the severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now I'm going to stop there. Because as always, we're going to spend some time. And uh, we may not get all the way through chapter 1 itself this morning. But I hope that as we set the stage and look at some of the building blocks for uh, what we'll be looking at together in this letter, that we'll start with something very important, that as Paul looks back and remembers not only who this church is, I want you to note something, and there's a word in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8, and I think verse 8 through 10 it is a great caption for this letter as a whole. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. Now, I love that word and your translation, whatever you might have in front of you, might, might give a little different word there. The one I'm reading from this morning says, the message rang out from you. That word rang out has the literal connotation of a ripple or a reverberating. Picture a pond that a rock gets thrown in and ripples go out across the pond. And, and Paul says, the message rang out from you. And isn't that a great, great picture? That their faith, they, a young church had come to the Lord, and their faith had caused ripples in the water. In fact, the gospel had rippled out and caused waves to go out from them. And, and what I love even more than that is this. Your faith in God, verse 8, has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything. Perhaps you've heard the saying that's thrown around often now, preach Christ, and if necessary, use words. Those, that, that's a life saying. Preach Christ, and if necessary, use words. What does that mean? That today, the gospel is shared, not by my words, not by my convincing others, but by my display of God's incredible transformation and power. And this is what we want to highlight this morning. That when Paul came to them and he notes, and again, I'm going to go back a little here. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 4. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. Now, we're going to just grab hold of these verses here this morning and spend a little time talking about the fact that the true gospel is not just a is not the power of positive thinking. It is a word that comes with power. And when Paul came to the people, he came to them not only in word, but in power. And this morning, as a church, both personally and corporately, we don't want to settle for anything less than a gospel that comes with power. 
derived from the presence of the Lord Jesus. That's what's key. You know, as I read through the word and, and the many letters that Paul wrote, it's often he speaks of this. He, he says in Romans 1, and again, you don't have to turn there for time's sake, but I want you to hear Romans 1 in verse 14 as he was reading to that, as he was reading to, uh, speaking to that Roman church. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Why was Paul not ashamed of the gospel, because in it, what was found? In it, the power of God for the salvation for everyone who believes. He was speaking a word that was not just a religion, a philosophy, or something that sounded good. It was something that came with an unquestionable power. And as he would write on, I want you to hear 1 Corinthians, a letter we just mentioned, chapter 2 and verse 1. He says this, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear, and in much trembling. He then says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4, my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Do you know, so often our gospel can get reduced to an intellectual exercise that our salvation is based on how many verses you've memorized, how many services you've attended, how many prayers you've prayed. Uh, you all know that I lived in, in Quebec for a number of years, and one of the places that we would uh, take our students every year was to St. Joseph's Oratory in the middle of Montreal. Not many people realize that the largest Roman Catholic pilgrimage in North America is in Montreal, Canada. And St. Joseph's Oratory is this uh, massive, massive temple built on Mont Royal um, in the center of Montreal. And, and there, people go to make special prayers. And it's a temple built in honor of Joseph, the father of Jesus. And there's these massive sculptures and uh, mosaics uh, in these many story talls. And, and you get these proclamations, Joseph, the protector of virgins, Joseph, the model worker, Joseph, uh, the conveyor of wisdom, Joseph. And they've betrayed all these many things that we know of God <laughs> to Joseph. And they pray to Joseph in hopes that he will in turn send the prayers to the Lord. Well, it's on those steps uh, up the mountain that you'll find many people on their knees doing their rosaries on every step. And you know, when the gospel gets reduced to the number of times I can pray a prayer, the number of steps I stood on my knees, or the number of verses I learned, the denomination, the the relation I choose to read from. If 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 my relationship with God is reduced to these things, we've missed it altogether. Paul said to the Corinthian church, "I came to you knowing nothing. In fact, determined to know nothing except this: Jesus Christ and Him crucified." I came to you not with persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit 
and of power. People believe not because of his passionate presentation. I want to remind you, as I have before, remember, Paul was the guy who, as we'll read in 1 Thessalonians, he says, listen, I'm, I am meek when in your presence, but powerful when I'm, I'm absent. He was, he was not what we expect. Remember, we get the vision in our mind that he was this powerful orator and had this incredible presence. He's the one that, that the Judaizers or those trying to tear his ministry down said, this man, right, he's all words when he's away in letter, but his speech is contemptible and his presence unimpressive when he's with us. This is the guy that was so boring that when he spoke too long, people fell out the window and died because they fell asleep. That was Paul. (laughs) Not an eloquent orator, but (laughs) here's what he was. A vessel through which the power of God was being presented. That's what led people in. And, And... And as we begin this letter together, here's where it starts. With a gospel that came not simply with words, but also with power. Do you know the people that have been monumental in my life? Are not the people, in fact, if I'm honest with you today, and partly it's because I've got a head like a sieve and I remember very little. The other part is this. I remember very little of what they said but I'll always remember what they did. There was a man who at the age of 13, 14, 15, in the church that I attended as a kid, there was a a mentorship program set up, and this guy was a looney tune. He was out to lunch. He was a, a bachelor who lived with horses, and he always bemoaned to me how he didn't find a wife, and yet when he described the type of woman he was looking for, It was a horse. Like he wanted a girl who wasn't scared to roll in the manure. And I mean, he was, he was, it was hilarious. But you know what? (laughs) Apart from that, there's not much I remember what he said because it was often off the wall and nutty. Here's what I do remember a guy who welcomed me, who'd spend time with me, who'd talk with me. He showed an interest that was not normal. He showed a a care and a love that was indescribable. Mm -hmm. That was so formational in my life, right? I remember very little of what he said, but the impact he had on my life was immeasurable because of what he did. And and as we look at the gospel of God, (laughs) We're not talking mere words of theology. We're talking about the divine power that comes from a God who, if we entrust ourselves to, shows up. (laughs) Let me give you another funny example. I was talking to a a, a friend who's a pastor, and uh, he's got some incredible life stories. And if that were one example in my life, let me tell you another in his. He was at a youth retreat as a young man, and he came as a cynic. And it was a ski retreat. That's all he needed to know to go in. Skiing? Great, I'm in. He's a mountain man, and he, he that, that was the excuse he needed. He would put up with any amount of Bible talk, evangelism, if it meant he could spend a day on the slopes. And so he did. Do you know what it was a, a, a as as he would describe it? They came in and one night, a, a blustery night, they came in for that evening devotional after a long day on the slopes, and a young woman came in and said, "Everyone, I've lost my contact lens. My parents are going to kill me. Can we all go and look for it?" And he, as the cynic, said. Are you kidding me? It's snowing outside and you want us to go look for your contact lens. This is ridiculous, right? The, the pastor said, hey, let's, 
let's pray first before we go looking. And he's like, really? You're going to pray about a contact lens? Come on. And he, he described this incredible picture of a group of people going out into a snowstorm and looking for a contact lens on the side of a mountain, right? Just outside this. It doesn't matter how big the area was. It's ludicrous no matter how small the area was, right? And as he, as he described the moment in the middle of the snow, while it's snowing, here comes someone. I've got the contact lens. I found it, right? Here's what he said. I will never remember what that pastor said in the devotional over that weekend. I don't remember what anyone said to me. I don't remember the verses that were spoke on. Here's what I'll never forget. <laughs> They found a contact lens in a snowstorm. <laughs> Isn't it funny how we think about words? God deals far more in something far greater. And that is a message that lives, is active, and has an indescribable power. It is a message that when Paul speaks of it, he says this, and now I'll read from 2 Corinthians. Again, for time's sake, you can note it. But in chapter 10 and verse 2, Paul writes, I ask that when I'm present with you, remember what we just said about Paul and how he looked in person versus how he spoke in word uh, and how he wrote. He says in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 2, I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence which I, pro which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. What great words. We are waging war. What? With weapons of warfare that are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. This is the gospel that went forth to the Thessalonians. A gospel that was not word, not theology, not mere convincing, but one sealed with the work and the wonder that comes from Christ and Christ alone. If you've ever wondered as a church, if we want the gospel of God to reverberate, <laughs> to ripple into our community, it will never come with how loud we sing our songs or how long we pray our prayers. The ripple will come when we come to the point and place where we see not only the word of God, but experience the power of God. And allow others to see the power of God. When we are willing to come and let people see <laughs> something that is inexplicable in any other way except God himself. That's Paul's testimony. Here's a man persecuting the church. Uh, a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a leader of leaders, seeking out to imprison the church, to have an impossible conversion. That's Jesus. This is John. And those were known as... Sons of thunder. That wasn't because Zebedee meant thunder. That was a depiction of their personality. The sons of thunder. John would later on be known as what? The apostle of love, who would write 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and the epistles of love. That's an impossible transformation. 
This is the Peter who was the wet noodle that was upside down and everywhere, jumping out of the boat, then sinking in the water. Jesus, you're the son of God, then turning around and Jesus saying, get behind me, Satan, because now he was saying, you don't have to suffer. He was the first one to speak, the last one to actually think. <laughs> the one whom Jesus would say, on this rock, I will build my church. What makes the one <laughs> who's the weakest become the rock to whom God would declare one on whom the church would be built? The rock was not Peter. The rock was whom Peter would become <laughs> Because Jesus would be that rock within him. That's an impossible transformation. Jesus was the rock. Peter had to come to the point and place where he realized <laughs> where his strength, his confidence, and his righteousness lie. You see, it all starts when people are allowed to see the full gospel. And the full gospel is nothing less than God's display. How often do we read in Corinthians, I have placed this treasure in earthen vessels, jars of clay. Why? So that the surpassing greatness might be seen of God and not of man. Have we come to the place where as genuine articles, We are presenting the impossible power of the gospel. That's an impossible peace in the midst of adversity. An impossible selflessness in the midst of a selfish, self-serving society. An impossible generosity in a world giving where everybody's taking. An impossible courage. Not the lack of fear, but the ability to step forward in the midst of it. Because we know the God who's got us. An impossible transformation. Change. In the lives of those who seem unchangeable. The gospel will ripple. The message reverberate. When we stop trying to tell people with words what ought to be displayed clearly with our lives. But they'll never see it unless first they see the genuine article. You'd have to first see my anger before you can see the Lord's peace and transformation from the anger. I'd have to let you see the cracks and my weakness before you will see the impossible strength that God's given. I have to allow you to see my foolishness and my folly before you truly understand the grandeur of God's wisdom that he's given. But that's the grand hypocrisy and the cover-up in Christianity is that I don't want you to see my cracks and failures. <laughs> I don't want you to see my weakness. I want to put on a performance of perfection for the Lord. Rather than by, by my bankruptcy, let the world see the incredible riches of the Lord. Paul noted as he wrote those words, as we've been reading 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5. Because our gospel came to you. With deep. You know how we lived among your sake. Paul was purposing every step. Paul was purposing every step, just as we read, as he wrote to the Corinthian church, I came determined to know nothing. 
What was Paul determined with? That they might see God's glory and nothing more, nothing less. That he would get out of the way, that he would purpose in everything he lived, in every way he walked, that God would be seen. That's why as we studied the, the letters of the Corinthians and 1 Corinthians together, I want to remind you that we, we read as he served the richest church that he, would have, that he would have spent time with. Do you remember what it said? As he spent 18 months in Corinth, the wealthiest society, he said, I took nothing from you. And in fact, even though I deserved payment from you, I was a tent maker the whole time. And in fact, poorer churches were supporting my missionary journey to you, the Corinthian church. Why? So that no one might make my boast an empty one. Paul's spending time with the richest church. What's he doing? Deliberately not taking a penny from them. So that no one could say his gospel's based on money. Make his boast an empty one. Even though he had every right to ask for a dollar, he refused it. Why? Because he wanted them to see the genuine article that is the power that comes from a glorious God and not see any sort of mixed or sorted uh, intentions on his part. You know how we lived among you. For your sake. Today, as we come together and we continue to study God's word, and that's what our Tuesday exercises are going to be, and we're going to build and hopefully get there, and you'll see where we're going together. But that is this that as we look into to the Lord and the word of life, that we'd never settle for anything less than the good, glorious gospel that comes with the power of Christ. And we always look, because we never want to read God's word and leave it at intellectual knowledge, because it would be easy to say, that's what Paul wrote, that's what Paul meant. No, the real question today is, as Paul presented, and he's looking back at a young church that was born in the midst of great difficulty, trials, and tribulation, and as he looks back, here's what he's recounting. (laughs) A church (laughs) that received a gospel that was not a way, something they were convinced, they were presented with power that came from on high. And what he's writing is to see that they're continuing and pressing on in that power. That they haven't fallen away or fallen back. Hebrews puts it well. And again, let me read for you Hebrews chapter 6. When the writer to the Hebrews, and these are difficult verses because he's actually talking about falling away from the living Lord. He says this in Hebrews 6. Verse 1, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, instruction about washings, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For in the case of those who've once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and they've tasted the good word of the God of God and the powers of the age to come. He's going to go on and make a warning to those who, and here's the words, have you tasted the good word of the God and the powers of the age to come? You see, because there was a group who would then taste it and yet choose to walk away from it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Have you tasted? There's the first question for today. Have you tasted 
that the Lord is good. <laughs> Sometimes, and I'm reminded uh, of, a, a, again, a friend of mine in ministry, and, and he would often at the morning, we do a morning Bible study. And, you know, as he would read the word, and maybe I've mentioned to you this to you before, but it's a great, a great exercise to go through. Do you know, every morning he'd read a chapter or chapters, whatever his morning reading was that day. And you know what he'd, he'd do? He'd cling to, he, he was an advertiser. And so he'd try and cling to a banner for the day that throughout the day he could remember. And I'll never forget one of those days as we sat together because there was a string of commercials running from Kellogg's uh, during that season of life. Maybe you are old enough to remember them, but they blindfolded people and then they'd give them a bowl of Kellogg's cornflakes, which is now is considered, you know, old fashioned dad cereal. Uh, I laugh. There was a day I was going through the checkout and I put a box of shreddies on the on the counter and the, the cashier literally looked at me and went really and and you could see in her mind she's thinking you just came from a cereal aisle that had all those options and you're bringing that to me like it was pretty funny but i was i felt judged but i also it was fine but you know what there was a string of kellogg's commercials and they would blindfold a group of people and they would shovel them a spoonful of Kellogg's cornflakes. And you know what the response was? Wow, this is good. Oh, what is it? And do you know what the slogan was that day? Taste it again for the first time. It was a great slogan. And I don't know how long the commercials ran, but I'll never forget it. And you know, as we were reading in the Psalms, Taste and see that the Lord is good. And he came up and he said, you know what? Taste it again for the first time. I'm wondering today, there's some of us here today, if you're like me, who perhaps are the age old believer. And you know the Lord, you know the gospel, you know the good truth. But do you know what you've forgotten? Somehow, he, through the demands of life and the demands as a church we put on Christianity, Slowly, we've come from this incredible message that brought freedom. And maybe you can think back to the moment you knew you needed forgiveness and the fact that Jesus had, in fact, forgiven you. And yet all of a sudden, what happens is the gospel and the good news slowly fades into from what Christ has done to, to my Christian demands. And now... I feel guilt because I haven't read enough for the Lord and I haven't done enough and I haven't converted enough and I haven't. And sometimes I need to stop and remember. I need to taste it again for the first time. That the gospel is a good news that comes in power, not just word, not theology, not religious rote but a defined destroying of strongholds. That's the gospel. Uh, an inexplicable forgiveness. A generosity, a love found only in the Father. Maybe there's some today and there's a moment in which we need to stop and taste it again for the first time and and stop the songs and the prayers and the singing and the debates and the theologies. And we're going to get there in First Thessalonians because it's the rapture pre, mid, post, a, pan, right? We stop it all and remember that this is a message that comes with a life-giving love from God. Today, do you need to taste it again for the first time? Have you, as the writer to the Hebrews, <laughs> tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and allowed it to slip away into the mundane? Or perhaps there's another today that feels they know the words of Jesus. They know the stories about Jesus. 
but have yet to see and truly realize the power of Jesus. That today, strongholds that once seemed unbearable or unbreakable can be broken. That things that I've done, errors I committed, (laughs) ways that I've wandered can be covered by the love of the Lord. That things that can be healed by a divine healing, inexplicable. There's a divine healing that comes from the Lord of life and the Lord alone. Have you come to know a gospel that is an intellectual one? Or have you come to know the gospel that is a powerful one? I think as a church today, that as we spend this time, it would be great to look and have a moment in which we take time to pray and ask the Lord, Lord, today, as we long to have your word ripple out, right? As we long for people to know you and have it ring out. We long to speak and provide a message, whether it be on the island of Gabriola, on Vancouver Island, on the mainland, wherever it might be. Have we truly experienced and are we prepared to live a gospel? (laughs) Remember Paul's words? We do not even need to say anything. Why? Because it was evident not in what they said, but in how they lived. Are we prepared to be the genuine article, first displaying my weakness so that the world might see his strength? First, displaying my inability so they can see God's ability. Am I willing to display my foolishness so they can see God's wisdom? Am I willing to display my poverty in a world where the world wants to show and shine? I'm a self-made person. I've got it together. Am I willing to display my poverty so that they might see the riches of a loving Lord? That's the question. Paul lived in such a way that the Thessalonian church might know a gospel that was not about word, but about the deeds of the Lord and his goodness. I love how it goes on in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 9, because Paul, in fact, had to say very little. He says, they themselves report, verse 9, What kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols and served the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. (laughs) Paul shows up and they're telling him what had been done. I love the moments where I've gone into a community. and, And I've met people and they'll say, hey, I'm not a part of that church, but all I know is there's some good things going on there. (laughs) There's evidence that sets it apart from a performance and brings it into the reality of the creator being and doing what he desires shining a lamp and a light in our midst. So today, have we tasted? And I think in our Tuesday study, there was some testimony of this very thing. I think it was Eric who said, you know, I experienced the word. I didn't just read the word. I I, I experienced it. Today, I love that we're in a community, and today our Brady Bunch checkerboard that's in front of me. Do you know what? The beautiful thing is that this is a community in which there is no judgment, nor are prayer meetings a place for gossip as to what's going on in the community. 
we want to genuinely stand before the Lord and bring before the Lord. Where are the areas in which we say today, Lord, we want to taste the power of the glory. And maybe there's some areas in which we need to raise up and hold up to the Lord and say, Lord, these are strongholds, and I know you're able to break them and bring them down. I'm bringing them to you. Is look inward and say, wow. At some point, from the excitement of conversion, the gospel became theory and theology, and I need to taste it again. I need to come back to the living Lord of life. And maybe there's some areas in which we can say, Lord, we want to see your activity here. Or maybe there's some areas personally or corporately, we can lift up to the Lord and say, you know what? <laughs> I failed to allow people. I've actually covered up your gospel, Lord, your glory, <laughs> by trying to produce it with my performance. God uses weak vessels. God uses and declares his righteousness often despite us each and every day. But today we pray, Lord, have your way. But it may mean that Paul wrote, first they need to see that I'm unimpressive in speech and appearance. God needs to lead me there so that the power can be seen. Have I admitted the fault of who I am so that I can truly embrace all that he is? Today, where's the Lord leading us? And what are some of those things we can hold to the Lord and present to him our longing to experience the power of the gospel, not just present it as something that's a performance? As we've often said, people will not see Christ by my perfection today. They will see Christ by my transformation. Have I allowed God to transform me by the power that is his in that way that a watching world will see there is no answer except for God himself? That's the stage on which God is longing to be seen. And until we allow the power of God to present itself, we'll be left presenting good arguments and good words, good morals, not enough. What the Lord, what the world needs is a good, glorious, and gracious God. That's what they need. What are your thoughts? I've spoken enough, long-winded as always. Uh, and as always, what I have to share with you today is simply uh, the stage and the springboard for you to share what you think. Maybe you haven't experienced the power. Maybe you've not been open to experiencing the power. Maybe there's ways in which we can pray for you. Maybe you've got testimony of the experience of seeing and knowing, and it may not be as obscure as finding a contact lens in the snowbank. It could, it could be very well that as I shared with you today, people will know God not by what you've said, but how you've lived. And that life will be dictated by if you've allowed the life of Christ to permeate through you. Have you allowed the things of God not only to go in, but to come out. How can we pray for one another? How can we encourage one another today that the Lord is the Lord of life and that he is alive and well? And again, the gospel, not a message, 
a word or a performance, but a power that comes from God that when you experience it is undeniable.